Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nate Beach Westmoreland, and uh, welcome to Mark Your Calendars Why Dates Matter to Adversaries. Over the next half hour, I'll answer that question. Then I'll give you some methods and perspectives to help you with your threat analysis and research. For a little background, I'm a threat researcher, mostly focused on state aligned threats. I'm also the head of strategic CTI at Booz Allen Hamilton. Disclaimer, this talk is my own and does not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of my employer. End disclaimer. I've been doing CTI for a decade and looking at international relations through the lens of cyber since graduate school. Throughout this time, I found that one of the most interesting CTI problems is figuring out why an attack occurred. Like, why did an adversary decide to act? Why in this form? and why at this time? To answer that last question, I found it's useful to consider the role that significant dates sometimes play in the timing of attacks. So what is a significant date? Dates can be significant for a lot of reasons. Religious reasons like holidays and festivals, uh, civic reasons like professional days, national days, memorial days, historic reasons like anniversaries of major battles or treaties, legal reasons like when taxes or corporate filings are due. In the context of attacks, be aware that dates can be significant to different people. They can matter to the adversary. They can matter to the target. They can even matter only to some third party observer, especially in the context of hacktivism or symbolic attacks. Now, I propose that adversaries care about dates for two main reasons. First, dates can confer some tactical advantage, wherein choosing to attack on a given day, as opposed to any other, raises the likelihood of achieving some objective. Second, dates can convey a message related to the significance of a date when an attack occurs. This allows an adversary to signal some information that is such as perhaps their motivation for attacking. So first, let's look at how dates can convey a tactical advantage to attackers. Click, click. Click, next slide, yep, there. All right, so you see, Attackers have used dates to their advantage since long before we found ourselves in this whole internet mess. In December 1776, General George Washington massed the main portion of his army in Pennsylvania. Across the Delaware River in Trenton, New Jersey, a group of British-aligned Hessian soldiers were encamped. Washington planned to cross the Delaware overnight on Christmas, march nine miles, and surprise these Hessians. Well, at least some of Washington's staff believed that attacking on Christmas would give them a leg up. As one noted in his diary, quote, they make a great deal of Christmas in Germany and no doubt the Hessians will drink a great deal of beer and have a dance tonight. They will be sleepy tomorrow morning. Well, ultimately there is no evidence the Hessians were drunk, but they were certainly tired, undressed, and caught by surprise when Washington attacked them at around 8 a.m., about half an hour after sunrise. On the morning of December 7, 1941, in a surprise attack, the Japanese won a shocking victory over the United States. In 90 minutes, Japanese bombers decimated the U.S.'s Pacific Fleet, which was docked at Pearl Harbor. Now, have you under, ever wondered why December 7th is the date that will forever live in infamy and not say the 6th or the 8th. In short, Japanese intelligence had determined that a Sunday would be the best time to strike. First, they assessed that the fleet was most vulnerable on a weekend. The ships would consistently perform training maneuvers during the week and then return to port. This could be easily observed as a standard operating practice. 
Second, they assessed that Americans would be ill-prepared for a battle on a Sunday morning. Americans were identified as being generally religious, meaning that many service members might be off at base attending church, or they'd otherwise be taking a day of rest. These insights clearly paid off as Pearl Harbor was ill-prepared to defend against a surprise Sunday morning assault. Probably the most common type of date-influenced cyber activity is date-themed phishing. At certain times of the year, many people expect to receive emails with attachments to open and links they need to click. Think uh, holiday greeting cards from vendors, gift cards from relatives. Some emails are even time sensitive, such as tax filing reminders from preparation services. Now, some dates are thus ready-made for interaction. What's more, an adversary can determine if some dates are relevant to targets with only a superficial socio-cultural awareness. For these reasons, basically everyone does date-themed phishing. From the most common scammers to your high-end state actors. Take the GRU, for example. In the days leading up to Christmas 2016, the GRU sent this fantastic phishing note to embassies and ministries of foreign affairs. I really hope you can read this on your screen. Note all of the fabulous details like signing off with love from Santa Claus and the note that the message was handled by the Christmas elves mailing system. What's more? Here's the cute card they included, complete with embedded malware. I don't know about you, but I'd be pretty excited to get GRU malware for Christmas. Now, this lure must have been a hint because they sent this one next year to all ministries of foreign affairs, diplomatic missions, yada, yada, yada. Now, if an adversary wants a, a slow or lackluster response to the ris riskiest parts of an intrusion, many choose to act when staff is least able to respond. This means timing attacks for weekends and holidays when people are out of office or on vacation. One memorable example occurred in Nepal on October 19th, 2017. That day, threat actor, maybe possibly North Korea's Blunaroth, attempted to steal $4.4 million from a Kathmandu-based bank, sending the funds via swift transfers to institutions in several different countries. After having made some 31 fraudulent transactions, the attackers attempt appeared to have dropped a wiper or equivalent malware that corrupted the bank's SWIFT server, leaving the bank scrambling. To make matters worse, the adversary had timed the attack to occur at the start of a five-day holiday, Tihar, during which most staff were on vacation, thereby slowing the response. There are many other examples of similar attacks. Uh, quickly, Iran's August 15, 2012 Shamoon wiper attack was timed to occur near the end of the Ramadan season, when many Saudi workers take time off due to the proximity of several holidays. Reportedly, more than 80% of Aramco staff had taken time off for that day in anticipation of the important Laylat al Qadar observance. Criminals also like to do this. In approximately 2012-2013, five cyber criminals reportedly stole 1.7 million pounds from the bank accounts of 48 small and medium-sized companies that were customers of an unspecified Slovenian bank. The gang reportedly scheduled the transactions to take place on weekends or on national holidays to reduce the chances that they would be detected and blocked by the bank. Dates may have significance both to the adversary and their targets. In 2019, a widespread protest movement had swept Hong Kong. Many locals were alarmed by a proposed extradition law that would have further eroded Hong Kong's dwindling autonomy from mainland China. On August 31st, 
uh, democracy activists plan to hold a massive protest. It was the fifth anniversary of Beijing announcing a controversial change to Hong Kong's electoral process. But China had other plans. It unleashed a massive DDoS using the Great Cannon, overwhelming LIHKJ, a web forum used for protest organizing. Undeterred, the organizers planned for another protest on October 1st, China's national holiday. It marks the founding, uh, the anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949. Well, this time the protesters knew what to expect. As this tweet shows, protesters plan for another DDoS against LIHKJ, KG, conse and consequently established backup communications channels on Twitter and other platforms. Afterwards, by the way, note, the site totally got DDoSed into oblivion, and this attack was more than twice as large as the August 31st one. So what have we learned so far? One. Adversaries know organizational readiness is not constant. They may plan to take advantage of times of weakness. Two, adversaries can predict many common periods when targets are weakened or susceptible, like when staff are going to be out of office or when they are expecting to receive certain emails, attachments, and links. Okay, let's switch things up. The other reason adversaries care about dates is for signaling i.e. adversaries can convey meaning of some sort to target audiences by choosing to attack on certain dates. Again, this phenomenon is not limited to cyber activity. On July 5th, 2017, North Korea conducted its first successful intercontinental ballistic missile test, a major national technical achievement. Well, Due to time zone differences, it was still the 4th of July in the USA. This wasn't a coincidence. Now, perhaps to make sure that the US got the message, Kim Jong-un addressed a crowd of onlookers at the test site. Quote, American bastards would not be very happy with this gift sent on their 4th of July anniversary. The crowd burst out laughing. He then added, we should send them gifts once in a while to help break their boredom. Indeed. Well, so this is not the only time North Korea has given the U.S. an unwanted birthday present. On July 4th, 2009, U.S. time, July 5th in Korea, a North Korea-controlled botnet launched the first of three waves of DDoS attacks. The botnet targeted 26 websites of various U.S. and South Korean government, media, and financial organizations. The U.S. targets included DHS, FTC, FAA, Yahoo, Washington Post, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The attack went on for several days before infected computers wiped their master boot records, crippling many infected bots. North Korea did not issue a press release this time, but they did leave a note. At midnight on July 10th, local time in Korea, the dozer malware began destroying victims' hard drives. The malware overwrote part of the MBR with the phrase, memory of the Independence Day, before proceeding to corrupt various files. You see, North Korea rather likes using dates to send these sort of stick in your eye messages to the US and South Korea. Other examples include a massive DDoS in 2013 on the anniversary of the start of the Korean War and a 2015 leak of sensitive South Korean nuclear plant files on South Korea's Information Protection Day. Lol, 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 lol. <laughs> now, anniversaries and holidays are popular times also for hacktivists to hold annual attacks. Since 1951, Israel has memorialized the murder of the six million Jews and the heroism of Jewish resistance fighters as Holocaust Remembrance Day, Yom HaShoah. It's a very solemn occasion in Israel that many Israelis take very seriously. By the way, side note, this is distinct from today's International Holocaust Remembrance Day, an international memorial day. So, 
In 2013, anti-Israeli hacktivists used the holiday to stage a campaign called Op Israel, vowing to, quote, erase Israel from the internet. On April 7th, all sorts of hacktivist shenanigans broke out. You can expect what this was. Websites were defaced, databases were leaked, DDoSs disrupted or slowed down major sites, attackers made lots of unsubstantiated boasts, and so forth. This stuff went on for about 30 hours before it finally died down. And they must have thought this was a big success because anti-Israeli hacktivists have conducted an op Israel operation every year since on April 7th. There's just one little problem with this timing. Holocaust Remembrance Day indeed was April 7th in 2013, but not so in other years. The date for this Remembrance Day is determined by the Hebrew calendar. Consequently, its date can vary from anywhere from April to early May. Now, well, therefore, the anniversary of the first op Israel has now become its own significant date, not Holocaust Remembrance Day. Other, other examples of similar hacktivist uses of dates for rallying include 9-11, the anniversary of the 2006 Israel-Lebanon War, and Guy Fawkes Day. Now, sometimes an adversary wants to make a point, but it's a little more subtle than we oppose you, we aren't intimidated, etc. And this is kind of hard to do. The idea that cyber attacks are terrible for signaling specific messages is a hot topic in academic cyber literature. This example is a pretty good reason why. Between 2015 and 2017, Russia repeatedly hit Ukraine with destructive cyber attacks. I believe Russia was repeatedly sending a message. History lesson. In December 2013, Russia's Vladimir Putin offered a bailout to Ukraine's pro-Russia president, Viktor Yanukovych. He appeared increasingly unstable and unable, and perhaps maybe an economic infusion might shore up his administration. On December 17, 2013, the two men penned an agreement wherein Russia would buy $15 billion in bonds and slash its natural gas prices. Well, the plan didn't work out, as the emergent Euromaidan movement toppled Yanukovych shortly thereafter. Although the new Ukraine government appeared resistant to paying down this debt, Russia had a backstop that might force Ukraine's compliance. Ukraine, you see, was seeking another tranche of IMF loans. According to traditional IMF policy, a country could not deliberately default on a loan to another country while seeking IMF loans. Well, that plan didn't work out either. On December 8th, the IMF announced that it would allow Ukraine to receive new loans. At this point, Russia proceeded to go through the stages of grief. It angrily called the rules change hasty and biased against Russia. It begged with Ukraine to still pay up. It even then offered to make a new deal with more favorable conditions. Okay, that plan didn't work out either. On December 20th, Ukraine defaulted on the repayment. Over the next year, Russia appears to have used cyber, several cyber attacks to make a point that it stridently objected to this default and the policy change. First, three days after the default on the energy loan, the GRU leveraged existing access to power distributors to shut the lights off the day after energy workers professional holiday. The next December on Ukraine's army day and two days before the anniversary of the waiver, the GRU hit multiple government agencies responsible for Ukrainian financial obligations. To make a point, the attackers used defacement imagery borrowing from the debt wiping hacktivists from the TV show, Mr. Robot. Then, the GRU disrupted power in Kiev with a logic bomb wiper with two encoded start dates. Guess what they were? The anniversary of the energy loan signing and the anniversary of Ukraine's default.
Perhaps Ukraine didn't get the message. Picking up speed over the next year, Russia appears to have sought its pound of flesh from Ukraine's economy. Within a day or two of various states related to Ukrainian independence, its association with Europe, and so forth, the GRU used primarily financial software supply chain attacks to distribute faux ransomware in Ukraine, going big with the massively destructive NotPetya attack on the eve of Ukraine's post-Soviet Constitution Day. So NotPetya caused billions of dollars of damage, impacting many countries far beyond Ukraine, and thus drawing global ire. I believe that the, U, that the GRU may have sought to thwart this growing anger by suggesting some moral equivalency between itself and Ukrainian cyber forces. The idea I have is that the GRU may have designed Bad Rabbit to look like Ukraine-aligned attackers had borrowed the Russian playbook. Allow me to explain. Like NotPetya, Bad Rabbit was a wiper disguised as ransomware. Its amateurish over infection mechanism seen here, fake flash downloads on, mo on mostly low traffic Russian websites resulted in a smattering of victims in Russia, mostly not very interesting victims. Curiously then, all of the major victims were in Ukraine, much like NotPetya, its ministries, transportation, and media. Comments by Ukraine security point to a concurrent phishing can can campaign. I've tracked this down, I've tracked down a lure. It's trying to distribute a rat disguised as updates to accounting software. Ah, uh, in theory, then this could be used to navigate to the compromised websites and download the bad rabbit flash updates. But of course, borrowing the GRU's playbook would mean attacking on a significant date. What's significant about October 24th? Not much in Ukraine, but wait for it. Since 2006, Russia has celebrated on October 24th Special Forces Day. It's the anniversary of the Soviet Union establishing the first GRU special purpose units in 1951. In other words, October 24th is the GRU's professional holiday. Chef's kiss. As we've just seen, some adversaries like Russia and North Korea really like using dates for signaling. Their own geopolitical competitors have taken advantage of this fact to send their own signals in response. On September 9th, 2019, North Korea celebrated its national holiday. US Cybercom celebrated this occasion by uploading some new North Korean malware samples to virus total. Not with much fanfare, mind you, but the message was clearly, we see you. Okay, perhaps they were being a little too subtle. In February 2020, Cybercom tried again. It uploaded more samples on Valentine's Day. And this time, as you can clearly see, they didn't forget to leave a note. After being repeatedly hit by Russia, Ukraine finally said last November that two can play at that game publicly pinning the Armageddon or Gamaradon threat group on the FSB's 18th center, all while Putin was in occupied Crimea celebrating Unity Day. In sum, understanding that some adversaries care about dates is quite useful for threat research. It's helpful when you're trying to assess an adversary's motivation and intent, as the date may be used to signal this information. The dates may sometimes be, the messages may sometimes be really subtle and thus easily missed or open to reinterpretation. Some adversaries, especially North Korea and Russia, really enjoy date signaling. So what can you do as a threat intel analyst or researcher with these insights into date-minded adversaries? 
Start by looking at your organization and determine if there are certain dates on which you tend to be weak or vulnerable to attack. Ask yourselves, are these dates externally observable or just easily assumed by an adversary? Now that we know when these dates are, make a staffing response plan. Figure out how you can respond if it hits the ceiling when everyone's on PTO. When, ask yourself, when are your staff likely to be targets of date-inspired phishing? If you figure this out, let them know. Raise awareness, use examples, use my deck, please. Uh, if you're a threat researcher, try the following process when you encounter an attack. Start by just figuring out the date. Make sure you know the local time as dates may change depending on time zone. Figure out, is it part of the work week for any involved parties or is it the work weekend? Note that not every country actually keeps a Monday to Friday work week. Make a short list of the entities to whom the date might be significant. Start with the victim and the suspected adversaries you're considering. Figure out then how the date might be significant. Check some calendars online that have holidays, observances, and professional days for all the involved countries. Make sure you use a calendar for the year of the, that the attack took place as dates may shift. Check the business calendar for these countries for fiscal and financial dates. Check out the historical significance. Admittedly, this can be a little harder. Uh, a good starting place would be to just look on Wikipedia. If it's a really significant date, it will usually appear on the country's page. You just have to do a fine page search. Finally, just look at what the signs are. What does the adversary actually said to draw attention to the date? Uh, messages in the code, defacements, etc and then just check the official sources. Has the adversary country said anything relevant? To wrap this up, here are my three sound bites. One, dates matter to adversaries, therefore they matter to you. Two, if you want to defend against these adversaries, be perceptive of when you are weak, predict when the adversary will figure this out, and prepare accordingly. Finally, if you are researching date-minded threats, start by gathering all necessary data just like I described, use it to place dates in context, and consider whether this changes your interpretation of an attack. If you want to learn more about some of these attacks, I've dropped a bunch of sources on a GitHub repo link here. So finally, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take questions.